So today is a Saturday, the 23rd of January 2021. We have come to train ourselves in samadhi. And uh, this is something that's very important because it gives us <clears throat> great benefit. So this samadhi we can translate as a firm establishment of the heart. And there are two different types of samadhi. There's that which is correct, what we call samma samadhi, and that which is incorrect, or micha samadhi. So this micha samadhi is that which is used to harm each other. And so just like how a thief needs to have samadhi to steal things, they also need to have this firm intention of mind. And they use that uh, to harm. Or a cat that's catching a mouse. A tiger that's about to pounce on a deer. Uh, these animals use samadhi to find their food. And that they have this firm establishment of mind to one level, uh, but they use it to harm each other. And also for us, we need to use samadhi um, in our studies and our works. Um, this all requires some degree of establishment and firmness of mind. Because if we don't have this, then we won't gain knowledge through our studies. Um, our work won't succeed. And uh, so if the mind isn't firmly established um, in our work, in our studies, um, then it will be shaking. It won't be steady. And also there are prob people who meet with problems. Um, for example, an illness in their body. And if their mind lacks peace, um, then they'll just be very scattered and they can get overly stressed. And through the stress, uh, the chemicals in the brain goes out of balance. And then they can develop another illness, one in the brain. And so this mind, it still depends upon the body. And it receives the feelings uh, that the body sends to it. So if there's no samadhi present, or if there's just a small amount of it, then the mind will be all stirred up. And um, if we think, or if we meet with something that becomes a cause for us to be upset, then we'll just follow that and get upset. And the mind will carry on thinking um, about problems, about uh, maybe about people who have passed away, and this causes us to become depressed. And our mindfulness, our awareness, just isn't in the present moment because we're thinking too much, we're getting stressed about different things. And this is very dangerous both for our bodies and also for the health of our minds. So if we don't care for our minds, then problems overwhelm them. But the samadhi that's taught within the path of Buddhism is this firm establishment of the mind, and it's one of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, um, the Samma Samadhi, or Right Samadhi. And so when we train ourselves um, in this, and then it becomes a cause for us to see the Dhamma, to see the nature, the truth, see into impermanence, into inconstancy. You can see... Uh, that all things are this way, and that there's, if we try to find a self within any of these things, we won't be able to find that true self. It doesn't exist within either us or other beings. Um, but the reason that we don't see this is because wisdom hasn't yet arisen for us. Our samadhi isn't well established, our sila is still lacking. And we haven't abandoned a sense of self through generosity. And so we come to train ourselves in this quality of samadhi, collecting our minds. And it's not something that's very complicated. It's not overly difficult or intricate. Um, just like when we come to watch the breath, and we watch the breath come in and go out, and we simply have our awareness. <coughs> recollecting this breath. 
And we can use a meditation word such as Buddha along with it, or we don't have to use that either. We can simply just know this breath come and go. And so we just have mindfulness recollecting at this point, um, knowing it until our knowledge of the breath becomes more and more subtle. And in the end, the breath will just leave on its own accord. Um, the meditation word that we're using uh, will just uh, leave our minds without our intending for that to happen, because the mind has reached a state of peace, and both the body and the heart feel very buoyant. In the beginning, however, this can be uh, something that's quite uh, tough to do. But as we train through it, and our uh, samadhi develops, um, then we do reach this inner state of peace. It may feel initially like our hands or our feet have disappeared. And uh, as well, this shows that uh, the mind is full of this inner joy to one level. So if there's a small amount of this rapture, then that shows that we've got a small amount of samadhi. This is kanaka samadhi. But as this joy fills up our hearts um, to ever higher levels, and then the body will feel lighter and lighter. And it'll come to the point where we we'll feel like we're just sitting in midair. <laughs> and the heart is full of this inner joy, full of happiness and rapture. And then as it comes together, it um, comes close to gathering into just one point and to uh, becoming uh, ekakada. So when it reaches the state of one-pointedness, we call this apana samadhi. And whether we are walking, sitting, standing, or lying down, it's possible for us to develop this samadhi if we're skilled at it. But it's tough when we're lying down, because normally when we do that, we just fall asleep. So we train ourselves in the other three postures of standing, walking, and sitting first. And uh, really it's not difficult to do this, it's quite easy. We just have our awareness centered here in this present moment. And when our mind is well established, then we call this samadhi. But how we develop this uh, depends upon our character, depends upon our temperament. And some people are inclined towards thinking a lot, towards a lot of doubts, a lot of proliferation. And perhaps their minds go up to the future. Uh, perhaps they uh, are concerned with this physical body. So they should contemplate a lot, pick up an object of contemplation, such as death. And they can recite this mantra of life is not sure, but death is for sure. Death is the culmination of my life. My life must end in death. And we can recollect death in this way. And uh, as we do this, um, this recollection becomes a constant uh, presence in our mind. And whenever the mind goes off into liking or disliking, it follows after these states, then we'll have the mindfulness there to be able to contemplate, to look and have our awareness focused on our mind. So when it's liking something or disliking something, then we know. And um, if the mind still goes off into proliferation, we know that our mindfulness is there with it. And then we contemplate, telling ourselves these things are inconstant, they're not sure, that our lives must meet with death, that we don't stay upon this world for long. So when we think of death in this way, then peace arises and the mind becomes disillusioned. And then the mind, the eye still goes and sees a form. We still perceive sounds. There are still thoughts which come up into the mind. But we contemplate all of these things. Contemplate that life is not sure, but death is for sure. And through this, the heart becomes softer. The mind becomes more malleable. It doesn't get so heavily involved in jealousy. Um, the oh, and we won't want to worsen any um, suffering that other beings are going through. So happiness arises, and arises through this contemplation into the um, not sure nature of life. 
So we bring up the feeling when we're contemplating death that we're like a cow who is being led off to the slaughterhouse. And it's very, very few, the number of animals in the situation that are able to escape from death. Perhaps once in a while, there are people who have kindness and compassion, and they buy one of these animals, and they're able to uh, escape. But this happens not often at all. So we think um, that our lives are constantly walking towards death, that we're getting ever and ever closer to this. And uh, we're going there. Um, We're walking there without stop. We bring up this object of recollection in this way. But if when we think like this, our hearts become depressed, then this is recollecting in an incorrect manner. Um, And we can't go like that. We can't uh, operate in that way. And the more we think like that, then just the the deeper this depression becomes until it turns into a mental illness. But for those people who have quite severe anger, who have uh, a lot of greed, whose delusion is intense, and there's a lot of inner chaos, the mind's stirred up a lot, and uh, perhaps they try to look into the breath and the mind isn't at peace. So this thinking of death, recollecting death, is uh, a very suitable object for them, recollecting that life must meet with death. And through this, so we'll be able to abandon unskillful states. Perhaps we can think about the people close to us, Um, perhaps a mother or a father, another close relative, a friend who has died. And then through the closeness of our relationship to them, we can get the feeling that our own life is really not sure. And so we bring this recollection deep into our hearts and and, uh, contemplate it there. And so when we do this, if we meet with a really strong emotion, um, the heart can still maintain a degree of peace. So we carry on practicing, um, using this meditation object, developing it until we become skilled at it. And the more often we do it, the more skilled we will become, until peace can arise within our minds. In the beginning it's hard work, but we must persist with it. We don't give up our efforts, and we uh, pull ourselves into this training. So in this practice of cultivation, of meditation, uh, we don't need to get involved in much doubting about it. It's not something that's complicated at all. And really we just use these methods of of, uh, contemplation or of meditation to bring the heart to peace. This is what we call samatha bhavana. So we can use the four brahma-viharas, these divine abidings, or anapanasati, the recollection of death. All of these are objects of meditation which bring the heart to peace, which make it centered, which make it stable. So there's no need to doubt about it. Whatever works to bring up states of calm, then we use that. We don't need to change it about much. But we take that one, the one that works the best for us, as the foundation for our meditation. And we carry on doing it so that our heart does reach the state of peace, and we um, become sure of that, that we can get there. Perhaps sometimes we may read the scriptures, and uh, they can tell us that recollecting death can only bring us to upajara samadhi, this neighborhood concentration. Uh, But in order to see into the Dhamma, we need apana samadhi, access concentration. So this can bring up doubts for us the way the recollecting death will really take us to see the Dhamma. But really all of these objects of meditation, they all reach that point, they all get us there. And when the mind is peaceful, um, then from that state we can look into the breath, or we can contemplate into anicca, dukkha, anatta, and in constancy, stress, and not self. And all of these methods take us there, they all reach that point of Dhamma because the mind is well established in peace already. 
So in the beginning, we need to bring up a sense of confidence in our meditation objects, that they are going to bring us to peace, that they do work. And then we accumulate our wisdom. So when we develop the recollection of death often, uh, then we think about death um, in this way. But we shouldn't just become despondent and sit around waiting for death to happen, waiting for our lives to end. That's not correct. There needs to be this sense of disillusionment and also stillness, also inner peace arise as well. But we also need to use memory to bring up perception initially. So like seeing the body as anicca, dukkha, anatta, um, these are initially our perceptions that we bring up, and this is close to wisdom. It's uh, quite close by. So when we cultivate our meditation objects, look after them, protect them, um, then the thoughts that come up, um, we may think that they are wisdom because they allow us to abandon greed, hatred, and delusion. They allow the heart to become at ease. But really this happens through um, perception. That's what the scriptures tell us. So where does wisdom arise from? Well, when we train our minds um, to see into the nature of things. Um, for example, we look at this body and see it decay, see it break apart. Or we watch the breath and see it as it comes in, stays for a while, and then goes. And then we will see into its inconstancy. And you see, do you understand? So we take the recollection of death, or we can take the recollection of death as the foundation for our peace of heart. And then from that foundation, we use anapanasati, seeing the inconstancy of the breath. Or we look at the body and see it as just being a collection of elements that disband, that uh, the earth, water, fire, and air all go their separate ways, and that this body is inconstant, and from here knowledge can arise. Or maybe a mental image, a limiter, of a flake of skin falling to the ground, or a strand of hair falling down, uh, can bring about clear understanding. And when we have understood, then the mind starts turning into this inner Buddha, this uh, inner nature of awakening, manifests in our hearts and we start to see the Dhamma. The path of sila, samadhi and panya, or virtue, uh, samadhi and wisdom, starts to gather together into one point and we see clearly. At this point, samadhi will sustain itself, whether we're standing, walking, sitting or lying down, this will all be within a state of samadhi. We may be sitting in meditation in a state of peace, and then when we get up to walk, the mind will maintain that level of peace. And it's really amazing, the mindfulness, the samadhi, that occurs in the stage of practice. In the beginning, however, it's difficult for us to meet with difficulties. Um, there's a lot of hardship that we experience. The mind may be really greedy at times. It may be full of hate. There can be this really strong clinging to a sense of self. But we don't worry. We don't give in to the thoughts that we just don't have much barami, that our, prog our progression is going to be extremely slow. But rather we bring up our efforts and really set our hearts on this way. Um, because None of this is beyond our capabilities uh, to reach in this life. And it's really, it's the first gate, it's the first barrier that's the most difficult. Um, taking things as a sense of self, taking things in terms of self. And if we're able to destroy this first barrier, then the next ones aren't difficult. So what this requires is the arising of vipassana, of clear seeing. And so we can think about this and see or ask whether the sense of self is really something that is that actually has an essence to it, that's real. And when our minds are in a state of samadhi, 
then when we watch the breath come and leave or we contemplate into death, um, then sometimes we'll be able to see clearly into this nature of anicca, dukkha, anatta. For some people, contemplating anicca, dukkha, anatta is able to bring their minds to peace. And then when they're firmly established in samadhi, then they can come out and contemplate uh, this all over again, contemplate the body once again. And then a new knowledge will arise. This uh, knowledge of vipassana will come up, seen clearly into the mind. And what's that like? Um, well, this knowledge that comes up is, uh, it comes from wisdom. It comes from our practice of the Dhamma. And it's not thinking, it's not proliferation. But rather it depends upon a mind that is firmly established, um, that is still. But when we sit and the mind isn't at peace, then we can use our thoughts at that point, thinking that life is unsure, but death is sure. And when we think in this way already, we think about death. Um, oh, sorry, we can think about people we know who have died already, and then bring this back to ourselves, telling ourselves that I too must meet with death, that death is constantly coming closer and closer to me. Or perhaps some people are skilled at watching their breath, and we should practice in that way then. Or some people are skilled with the words Buddha, Dhamma, or Sangha, and we do that. We use whatever works to bring the mind to stillness, to peace, that pull the mind into a state of samadhi, that allow them to collect together. And uh, when we practice, then the mind will collect all by itself, and knowledge will arise all by itself. And we'll see that all things in this world are unsure, they're all unstable and constant, that everything is arising and ceasing, and this clarity of insight will go deep into our hearts. And we see this with our inner eye, it's not the eye of the flesh, because the external eye it takes everything itself, it perceives everything in terms of me and them. It's caught in this realm of samuti, of conventions, and believing that the names that we give things are real. But when we see internally into this nature of conditions that they arise and cease, then the understanding is clear. And the joy, the rapture, the fullness of heart um, that we experience um, floods our minds. And this can go on for many days and many nights. So in the beginning, we start off with faith, and then we practice, we build up goodness, we cultivate merit, we do skillful deeds, and these become the causes and conditions for us to understand the Dhamma. So our faith is full, and we already have right view, we already have a belief in karma, a belief in merit and in demerit. So what we need to do is to practice. And none of these stages of the practice are beyond our abilities. Our mind can reach the state of inner Buddhahood in this life. And this inner nature of awakening can manifest in our hearts within this very life. In the beginning it's tough, but we just carry on doing it. And in the end, our minds will gather together into peace and clear seeing will arise. So we need to practice this way, this noble path that takes us to understanding the Dhamma, that allows our minds to flip over uh, from taking things or believing in wrong view and uh, gaining right view, from taking things in terms of a self and seeing them rather as not-self, seeing clearly into the nature of all things. So we set our minds on training in this way, and uh, we carry on doing it. We develop this path constantly. There's no need to have any doubts about this way of practice. So may all of you uh, cultivate and grow in this way of Dhamma.